Last chapter, we studied the kinetic molecular theory, which was used to explain why gases, liquids, and solids behave the way that they do. This chapter, we're going to learn a little bit more about gases in detail and how they behave under certain pressures and temperatures. All gas molecules exert pressure on any surface they collide into. Remember that gas particles are moving around at very fast speeds, and they collide with whatever container they are in, and this creates pressure. The larger amounts of gas that you have, the greater the pressure, and this is due to having more particles colliding with the surface. It's kind of like putting air in your tires. If the air pressure in your tires is low, you can add more air to the tire, and then you have more particles of air bouncing around inside the tire, creating a higher pressure. Pressure is defined as the force per unit area on a surface, and it's calculated by taking the amount of force and dividing it by the area. There are many different units of pressure. The SI unit, or the standard unit, is the Pascal. However, in chemistry, we more commonly use atmospheres as a unit of pressure, millimeters of mercury, or tor. The unit of tor is equal in size to a millimeter of mercury, and it was named after the man who invented the barometer. A barometer is a device that measures atmospheric pressure. It was first invented by Evangelista Torricelli in 1644. In honor of this invention, one millimeter of mercury is also called one tor. How Torricelli's barometer worked, he took a long glass tube and filled it with mercury and then inverted it into another container that also had mercury in it. Some of the mercury inside the glass tube flowed out into the surrounding beaker, but only up to a certain point. That point depended on the amount of atmospheric pressure pushing down on the surrounding container. Torricelli noted that at sea level, the height of the mercury was always 760 millimeters, or approximately 30 inches, which is the value that we associate with normal atmospheric pressure. However, higher elevations will have lower pressures, and this is because there are lower amounts of gas in the upper atmosphere. If the air is thinner, there is less air particles bouncing around to create the air pressure, and that will make the height of the mercury in the tube lower. Another common type of barometer that we use today is called the aneroid barometer. You may have seen one of these in your home or in a science laboratory, where it has several numbers in a circle around the dial and then a needle that points to whatever the air pressure is inside. Instead of using mercury, an aneroid barometer works by using a metal coil that has been evacuated of most of the air. Then the surrounding air creates pressure on that metal coil, allowing it to expand and contract. And then through a series of like levers and pulleys, the amount of expansion or contraction of that metal coil is magnified using a pointer. That pointer then tells you what the current atmospheric pressure reading is. Another device that measures pressure is called a manometer. This measures pressure by using a U-shaped tube and attaching an enclosed gas sample to one side of the tube. That gas creates pressure on one side of the U-tube, pushes the liquid up the other side, and then the difference in the height of the tubes allows us to determine the pressure. Normally a manometer is hooked up to a gauge that uses a needle to read the pressure. One of the laws describing how pressure affects gases is called Dalton's Law. You may remember John Dalton from the chapter when we studied atomic theory. John Dalton proposed that all matter was made up of small indivisible atoms, that all atoms of one type of element had the same mass, and that these atoms could be separated and recombined to make new compounds. That same scientist came up with a law of partial pressures, which stated that the total pressure of a gas mixture is the sum of the partial pressures of the individual gases. So for example, the air that surrounds you is composed primarily of nitrogen, oxygen, argon, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. Each of those gases' individual pressures contributes to the overall pressure of the air, and so we can calculate the total pressure by taking the individual or partial pressure of oxygen, adding it to the partial pressure of nitrogen, adding that to argon, water, and carbon dioxide, and all five of those gases combined would equal the total amount of pressure from the air. We often use Dalton's Law when we are collecting gases in the lab. In order to collect a gas in the lab, we often collect it over water. So for example, we might take a graduated cylinder and fill it with water and flip it upside down into a beaker. 
and then using glass or rubber tubing, we might force some gas into that graduated cylinder. As the gas is collected in the tube, it displaces the water and pushes the water down into the beaker. But the gas that we collect is not pure. Most of the gas in the cylinder is the gas that we are collecting, but it's also mixed with water vapor. If you remember from the previous chapter that liquids will vaporize by evaporating from the surface of the liquid to create a vapor pressure above the surface of the liquid. And so we can use that concept to calculate the partial pressure of the gas. The pressure of the gas plus the pressure of the water vapor will equal the atmospheric pressure. And so as long as we know what the atmospheric pressure in the room is, and we know the temperature of the water, we can calculate what the partial pressure of the water is and subtract that from the atmospheric pressure in order to determine the partial pressure of the gas that we are collecting.